Hi, my name is Bob Grenier and I'm a volunteer for the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Thank you for joining me in this video, which is Opening the Door Part 1. So, one of the critical aspects to allowing this process to proceed is to effectively allow, according to Piantelli, the aka minus, H minus, into the transition metal. And when he was explaining this to us, he was saying that uh, you needed to do something specific to allow this to happen, and that was to separate the valence and conduction band. Okay, so at the time I accepted this, I didn't wholly understand it. Um, I asked a couple of weeks ago of my translator, who is sitting behind the camera here, Emmanuel Ruggiero, um, if he uh, mistranslated it or got it correct, and uh, he couldn't give me a straight answer. So I just assumed that Piantelli was right, given the fact that our data was matching kind of what we expected to see, um, given what he had told us otherwise. So took the assumption forward and explored the nature of band gaps and how one might separate them. So let me just take you through uh, what band gaps are. So there's a lot of subjects I want to discuss in this video uh, and hopefully I can make it simple uh, so that you can get an overview uh, of the process and what's critical. And also I'd like to um, uh, say how that relates to the uh, hot cat and the normal temperature reactors uh, such as Chalani's wire, um, Piantelli and Ficardi's work and uh, Rossi's original ECAT. So let's look at what band gap means for various types of material. Two things that you want to be interested in here, that's the conduction band here and the valence band. Uh, this comes from a presentation, there's a couple of slides from a presentation. All of the links to the uh, uh, slides that are external uh, to the presentation that will be provided with the uh, uh, links uh, to the video, uh, there will be direct links in, those that, in that PDF to the presentation so you can go and explore them in more detail. So essentially, for an insulator, the conduction band and valence band have a large band gap and that is why it's able to stop, uh, you know, insulate things. So this might be your insulating tape that you put around some electrical wire or your uh, uh, protection around your electric cables, those kinds of things. Then for a uh, semiconductor, the conduction band and valence band are quite close together. And this means that uh, uh, you can then sort of dope the, the, the region in between such that you can uh, uh, create, um, uh, uh, stimulate uh, conduction between the two uh, in, say, a transistor. Um, for a conductor, uh, you have uh, the conduction and valence bands overlapping. So essentially, Here's our conduction band and it's overlapping with our valence band. What Piantelli is saying is that you, in order for this process to work, you need to separate uh, the conduction and valence band and in a metal they're overlapping. So let's see how we might do that. Well firstly <clears throat> if you want to promote uh, electrons uh, into high en higher energy levels in a conductor uh, metals, uh, thermal energy puts many electrons into a higher energy state. So you can promote them from a, <clears throat> a filled band into an empty band. Okay, but that isn't the whole picture. This slide's quite critical. I, I, I think I understand it. Uh, um, uh, I'm sure you will uh, pour over it. Uh, but essentially, uh, what we are looking at here is um, discrete energy levels for an atom in free space. So uh, if we have an atom here and an atom here, imagine there are two silver atoms floating around in a near vacuum, then these uh, silver atoms' energy bands would be separated. Okay, 
But as I bring those silver atoms closer together, or let's call them nickel atoms for now, uh, and they start to merge uh, into uh, forming a lattice, and other uh, nickel atoms are coming in, uh, and we have a lattice, there's those separated energy bands uh, uh, split out and become, uh, sorry, separated energy levels split out and become bands, and in a conductor they come uh, uh, together so much so that they overlap. So back to the, the, the graph here. Um, here. Over here we've got, so we've got interatomic separation. So over here we might have atoms on their own. And as we get closer and closer and closer, uh, you can see uh, the bands uh, form. And then we get down here, we might have conductors and uh, we've got the uh, conduction band and valence band overlapping. So, Intuitively, this would say that um, if we wanted to separate the conduction and valence bands, we might want to uh, uh, try and pull the atoms apart somehow. And there are a number of ways that that can happen. So first I want to look at uh, low temperature reactors. Piantelli says in his patent, that you must have uh, nickel clusters um, above a certain number of atoms and below an, uh, a, a maximum uh, uh, level of atoms. And this is in part do, due to uh, wanting to uh, enable the separation of the atoms so that you can create this uh, separation between the conduction and valence band. And it's also to do with the uh, surface plasmonics. Okay, and we'll come on to those, uh, at least uh, an overview, uh, later in the presentation. Okay, so he's saying um, uh, that the actual number of atoms uh, you need in a cluster also depends on the, the particular transition metal that you're trying to uh, uh, operate the process with. Okay, um, so I'll look at this uh, material here. This is an SEM image of Vale 255 filamentary nickel. This is the same type of nickel that we used in uh, Bang uh, experiment when we were doing it uh, in Minnesota at the beginning of last year. Uh, and the, the nature of this nickel is that it's, it's not uh, uh, little discrete spheres. Um, uh, it is kind of spheres that are almost uh, linked together um, so that they're kind of globular and, and filamentary. And uh, what you can see here is that there are structures on uh, this material that are much smaller than the bulk of the material. And you can imagine that, uh, you know, as you get towards the tips of these or on the, the sharp edges, um, there's a fair bit of separation between the other uh, uh, at atoms in the cluster when the, the uh, uh, metal is excited uh, thermally. Here you're looking at uh, two other types of uh, carbonyl nickel. This is Hunter AH50 and this is the kind of nickel that we used in glow stick 5.2. And as you can see it's, it's more um, individual particles and uh, it looks like there's some accentuation in the, the, um, uh, the crevices and the peaks uh, uh, in, in the overall particle clusters. Uh, this here is, is Alexander Parkamov's uh, uh, nickel material. Now, it has been said uh, by Bob Higgins, that these are essentially the same. Um, my uh, looking at them gives me an impression that these particles are slightly more um, fine-grained in, in their structures uh, and it might be just a resolution thing here but I, I would imagine that if you are uh, producing this process so th this process uh, nickel carbonyl is produced from, from uh, uh, carbonyl, uh, nickel tetracarbonyl uh, it's a very toxic material uh, basically carbon monoxide mixes with car uh, nickel and this makes it a volatile, uh, um, uh, it's like a chemical vapor deposition. And, and essentially it, it comes up and then you deposit down uh, and you create the nickel clusters. And essentially when you are um, creating nickel clusters, uh, depending I, I imagine on the rate of 
um, the deposition uh, uh, and the overall processing, just like snowflakes are different shapes or they can be balls of ice or they can be um, kind of softy balls or they can be clusters of um, uh, individual snowflakes making a cluster. I imagine a similar process happens here. You get different types of structure um, from the same kind of growth process, uh, uh, but depending on how your pro the, 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 the actual procedure is conducted. So I just want to link you out to an external uh, uh, page on Wikipedia. Okay, so here we are, and um, what you're looking at here is kind of a, a variety of different structures uh, that you might create um, that are in the lines of a, a dodecahedron. Uh, so you have a rhombic dodecahedron here, and all the way down to this um, stellated do dodecahedron. Um, and if you kind of like study these after you've seen the video and, and look back at the Parkamov nickel, you may see that whilst it's not a, a nanoparticle, these are micrometric particles, uh, uh, maybe four or five uh, nanometers, uh, nanometer, sorry, uh, mi micrometers <laughs> and up, um, the, the structure of the surface is made up of much smaller uh, 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 components. And if you look at what you're seeing here, you may see uh, certain uh, uh, variations of these structures in the surface. Now, uh, crystallographers would be much better at uh, uh, telling you what's, the, what's actually going on there. But let's go back to the um, uh, Parkamov nickel. Okay, so, so you've got something here that looks a, a bit like an icosahedron. And you've got something here that uh, over here that looks more like a cube. Um, but if you delve into the actual structures in there, you've got more like stellated dodecahedrons uh, in the uh, substructure. Okay, so uh, there's a lot going on with this and there's lots of kind of holes and stuff in there as well as, as it comes. So, uh, what are the other approaches we can use to uh, separate the uh, the nickel atoms or the transition metal atoms. So uh, in the separation one slide here, we can oxidize the surface and then reduce the uh, um, nickel by removing the oxygen, say in a hydrogen atmosphere. And this creates a surface modified uh, structure like uh, uh, Francesco Cellani. Uh, there are other reasons for removing the oxygen, which I will deal with in a later presentation. Uh, then uh, we can make a nickel hydride on the surface and, and the actual hydride process helps to uh, separate the nickel uh, also. Uh, and then we can use heat and there's a process called DBI where, where uh, it's to, related to heat capacity and I encourage you to go and look at DBI uh, um, on Wikipedia. Uh, but essentially um, uh, when you're in a crystal lattice uh, and you've got, uh, you're raising the temperature. At some point, the, the, the atoms can only move uh, uh, to a maximum degree uh, before they, they, they can't go any further. And that limits the, the, the distance they can achieve just as pure nickel atoms in, in, a, in a cluster. So by oxidizing and reducing, you might create sort of some extra cavities. Uh, one Rossi uh, approach by Rossi uh, that we used in the Glowstick 5.2, uh, as advised by Alexander Parkamov, was to uh, heat very quickly um, to cause uh, the uh, inherent water in the material to turn to steam very rapidly. And, and this is like kind of semi smashing it and making cracks inside the uh, structure, uh, which uh, as I'll talk about later, may be very important to the process. So that's one we're, we're creating cracks, so there's actually some physical, extra physical separation other than these structures all over the carbonyl nickel. And then you've got the uh, um, oxidization and, and re reduction, which is kind of also separating out some of the material. Uh, and then you've got the hydriding process, which is separating some of the atoms as well. Okay, so 
Um, then there's the, the, the triggering process. Okay, so once you've got the um, separation sufficient for, or, uh, for the uh, nickel atoms such that um, you, you, you know, there's a, there's, you're near to having a band gap. Um, um, you can imagine that the, the hydrogen that you've heterogeneously split uh, using the nickel catalyst surface uh, to H plus and H minus, there's some H minus in there, which is our notional virtual electron. Uh, uh, and it's sitting there in this whole sea of, of uh, other electrons that are in the conduction band, but it's currently straddling the, uh, the uh, uh, valence band as well. Um, then what you do is you give it a, uh, a shock. Any kind of shock will do. And this is why Pian Telica basically lists in his painting any shock that would cause a shock uh, to, to the system. And it's very interesting, actually, because when I was going over this a couple of weeks ago, I came across, the, this is the list of uh, different methods in, in his patent uh, for shocking it. Many of you, them you will see in other patents and, and, and other works employed. Um, but essentially, the number one list here in the list is a thermal shock, in particular caused by a flow of gas, in particular of hydrogen, which has a predetermined temperature that is lower than the active core temperature. Yeah? So why did this light go, aha, to me? Well, <laughs> we had a leaking cell in 2013 in southern France. It was Mathieu Vallat's experiment. It was a Chalani wire experiment. And this was the first blog article I asked everyone to read and digest, because it's absolutely critical to our journey of discovery. And <laughs> Essentially what happened, because it was leaking every one to two days, we had to recharge it with fresh, cool hydrogen. Okay, so it's running at the sort of four, five, six hundred degrees temperature that the Chalani wire runs at, on the actual wire. Uh, and then you, we're putting in fresh, cool hydrogen from a tank that's like at room temperature, and as it expands, that will cause it to even be lower. And that comes into a, a, an environment that's... Um, in excess of 300 degrees or whatever. And as that comes in, it's basically cooling it and, and it's shocking the material. And, and, and we saw um, the kind of gamma pulse, or that's what we called it at the time. And this was something that allowed us to uh, be excited about what we saw with glow stick 5.2. So if you can imagine you have your conduction in your valence bands and they're overlapping and, and, and the atoms are going up and down like this uh, in the crystal lattice and some of them are separated because there's hydrides in there and some of them are separated because there's deformations or crystal uh, boundaries or, or, or whatever, a range of different ways you could, you could cause some separation. Uh, uh, maybe there's impurities in there like the palladium impurities you had which, you know, when you took them out, the, the Pons and Fleischmann uh, uh, cathodes didn't work. So, um, so you, you have your impurities in there and this shock comes in and it's like a, whether it's a laser or it's, a, it's an ultrasound or uh, it's a, a magnetic pulse or it's an electrostatic pulse or in our case, just a, a pure temperature pulse. As that comes in, it sends shock waves up, up and down and depending on the structure of your material. So for instance, if you've got um, smaller structures and this is why it's important to have it within this upper and lower bound. If you have these smaller structures, this allows the uh, metal on the surface to move uh, a lot further when, when this big shock comes through, this phonon shock comes through. And so it's almost on the outside. And then you, you imagine there's kind of like uh, the electrons and the fake electrons, the H minus, and then it's kind of like going vroom, vroom, vroom. And this impulsive trigger allows, and, 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 and it took four years for Piantelli and Ficardi to establish this as, as th what was going on, it allows for the capture of the H minus. So uh, you can debate whether it's kind of like up here and it's coming in and out so that it does it that way, or it's, it's just on the edge and then you're just punching it a little bit further. And you can, he calls it anharmonic oscillation uh, stimulation. Um, uh, Vysotsky will, will, and, and Dubinko uh, will call it discrete breathers. Um, uh, and that's my understanding of uh, the terms. 
but anyway, the, the process allows the H minus to be captured. Uh, okay, so moving on, I want to talk about a kind of different approach you can get, and, and, and if you really want to force it, like I'm saying, that if you have um, a lot of boundaries uh, between uh, one material and the next, uh, then you have more flexibility because it's not constrained by the lattice. It's not constrained by the lattice. So if you therefore have these nano caves uh, that in, in your uh, micrometric nickel, um, that might do something. And I'd, I'd like to draw your attention to the Rossi um, 12th of March 2012 video where he said, uh, he was asked by Ruby Carrot, uh, what uh, is the temperature at which the ECAT operates? And uh, Rossi, um, <laughs> seemingly very honest, <laughs> He says, well, we must put a distinction between the intimate inside of the ECAT and the outside where it happens, the heat exchange between the water and the ECAT. In the intimate of the micro caves where, react, uh, where reactions, where the effect occurs, we reach 1500 degrees centigrade. 1500 degrees centigrade. Now, I know what you're saying. That's over the melting point of nickel. Okay, yes it is. A molten piece of nickel might be able to move a little bit further than something that's constrained in the lattice, right? Now, if you imagine you've got your caves here and the rest of it is like a solid lattice, you've basically got a, a slightly more plastic surface uh, when it's at these temperatures. Now, you might say, how does it get to these temperatures? Well, uh, recent research, which you can go and have a look at, the link is from uh, the presentation um, on solar power research is they're creating uh, a nanometric caves within their um, uh, solar material and what this allows is uh, high levels of plasmonic uh, uh, concentration and they're saying here um, 100 times the intensity of impinging uh, infrared or, or, or photons. Okay, so the concentration it happens in the caves. So here we have a correlation between the current um, uh, state of the art in, in uh, 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 development of uh, solar panels and what Rossi said in 2012. You have effectively some kind of energy localization. I'd just like to draw your attention if you would have a look at the video which is talking, uh, that's linked, which is talking about the, uh, the solar panel technology. They are <laughs> filling these caves with silicon uh, oxide, silicon dioxide, and uh, that is effectively kind of lensing the tops. So you've got the silicon dioxide into the nano caves, and uh, this is just funny because it's it's basically what Chalani's doing. He's he's creating his surface modified uh, a constantum, which has all these pores in it, and then he's kind of brushing it with sol gel, which is silicon dioxide, and then he's heating it again. And so you can imagine that the, the silicon dioxide is kind of filling up those cracks and that gives you a, a, a conductor dielectric uh, um, interface which is very good for uh, um, surface plasmonics. And in the case of a P and Telly, what he's doing there in, in his reactors is he's got a, a hydrogen, a low pressure hydrogen environment and, and the metal surface which is also a good environment for surface plasmonics. Okay, moving on. High temperature reactors. What's the big difference here, okay? In my opinion. <laughs> okay, so when we were looking uh, at uh, testing the, uh, the, the accuracy of the thermal determination for the Lagana report, uh, one of the last experiments we did uh, ended in an explosion. We called it bang. Uh, but it was extremely important because this particular experiment froze a moment in time in the, the, the actual nature of what was going on underneath. Uh, and this gave us a unique look at what the uh, material would look like after uh, um, uh, you know, running up to the high temperatures with the lithium aluminium hydride and, and nickel in play. Uh, again, I, I refer you back to the fact that at the time we were using uh, Vale 255 uh, nickel. But looking at the slide here, 
Um, you have the lithium uh, aluminium uh, complex on top. Um, and so uh, uh, we came up with this concept for GS 5.2, which is that we know that there's some nickel dissolved into this uh, uh, lithium aluminium that was molten when it was at temperature. Uh, and that by cycling that, you could precipitate nanoclusters um, uh, from the supersaturated lithium uh, where the nickel is a solute. Uh, so essentially the process would be raised temperature of lithium to dissolve maximum nickel, lower temperature to allow coagulation of uh, uh, nickel, um, uh, flocculation that should probably say, uh, of nickel precipitates and then uh, repeat from step one. But I have a question. Is there more going on? So, this is really interesting. This is about a kind of catalytic process of separation uh, at high temperatures using lithium in this concept of a, a, a lithium nickel solute process. So I want to draw your attention to some uh, research um, which could give us an insight as to what's going on. So uh, I'm calling this separation two and uh, uh, this, this is the information from the previous slide, but I'm adding another uh, um, uh, uh, pit, bit to the bottom here. Lithium hydride aids even further separation. How is it doing that? Well, essentially, if we add hydrided nickel and lithium hydride, and we kind of all mix it up and warm it up and so on in our mixing pot, what, you, what we end up here is a peros <laughs> perovskite type hydride. Uh, lithium nickel hydride 3 uh, structure. Okay, there's a link to the paper there. I recommend you read it. But essentially, what we end up with is, is LiNiH3, uh, where we have a nickel atom right in the middle here. We have one, two, three, four, five, uh, but it's shared between other uh, uh, nickel atoms, uh, um, hy hydrogen atoms. And then this is again surrounded by, um, sorry, that's six hydrogen, uh, but it's shared, as I said. And then we have these um, lithium atoms here around the outside. So you can imagine that our nickel that was nice and cosily sitting next to some other nickel when it was in the crystal lattice, uh, by a uh, process of being hydrided and then, then uh, uh, exposed to lithium hydride, you're ending up with it quite separate from other uh, nickel atoms. So it's, it's almost like that nickel that's in the uh, uh, free space, there's like a single atomic of nickel in, in, in a vacuum where the uh, band, the energy bands are completely separate. How this particularly plays out uh, in, in this uh, stimulation process at high temperatures, I think that needs some more investigation and I'd urge you to kind of say, go out there, look at what this, the implications of this are. Um, uh, but Let's put that to bed for a minute and I just want to move on. I want to look at a nanoparticle vibration response. Now this is some very recent research, uh, but concepts around this uh, have been uh, in the literature for uh, quite some years. But anyway, uh, there's a link to the particular article and uh, essentially it's the vibration response when you start to create materials that are made at smaller than a range of 10 to 20 nanometers. So. Um, the vibrations of the outermost atomic layers on the surface of the nanoparticle are large and play an important role in how this material behaves. Okay, so you have small nanoparticles, um, smaller than something between 10 and 20 nanometers, and then the outside becomes very kind of able to vibrate to a large degree, and this plays into this whole idea of wanting to separate the conduction and valence bands. Okay, so for some applications like cat catalysis, thermoelectronics and uh, electrics and, and superconductivity, these large vibrations may be good. Yeah? That's one piece of context. Then there are, I mentioned earlier about uh, surface plasmons, and I, I know uh, there are people out there that uh, are, are really uh, keen about this subject, and they should be. Uh, it's something that Martin Fleischmann uh, led some research in, 
Um, and uh, it's funny that it's come full circle and it seems to be so important when we're looking at this particular technology. Okay, so there are such a thing as uh, localized surface plasmons, which are important um, for uh, nanostructures. Uh, and uh, essentially, enhancement of electromagnetic field near to the surface of nanoparticles structures leads to non-linear metamaterials. Okay? And NASA were talking about this in this presentation you can go to. Method for enhancing enhancement of surface plasmon polaritons to initiate and sustain LENA. Okay? Initiate, this is what we're talking about here, opening the door, and then later we'll talk about sustaining the LENA. Okay? And uh, it isn't just that it's, it's maybe increasing the temperature and, and uh, the kind of dynamics, the non-linearity at the surface, but there is also this effect here, where it's saying localized surface plasmons on metal nanoparticles in the absence and presence uh, center and right of external electromagnetic fields. So we've got these uh, three different states, and it's saying here spectrally that localized surface plasmons resonances are in the visible to near infrared spectral regime. If excited at resonance, the amplitude of the induced electromagnetic field can exceed the exciting fields by a factor on the order of 10. So we could put maybe a, a, an electric field across this and stimulate this process by 10 times the uh, you know, amount of electric field that, that's applied. And bear in mind, electric fields are there right in Piantelli's patent from the outset. So this is not something he didn't really understand. And he did talk a lot about this sea of electrons uh, that was very important to, to the process. Okay? So I have a link here to, sex, uh, to this present, um, a presentation here. So I think it's a German university. Um, uh, and you need to read section uh, 7.5 here. There's a wiki here. And there's also uh, uh, an expert from a UK university um, who does a good discussion on um, uh, plasmonics and their importance. Okay? That actual link will take you to quite an important part of the presentation that he makes. Moving on. So, it's saying that they're visible to infrared. So, the, the near infrared down here, the infrared. Remember, I'm talking about terahertz radiation. Okay? So, uh, if we have some back radiation from our lead or our tungsten, or we have some impinging uh, radiation from, uh, I don't know, a terahertz source uh, of some kind, with a combination of uh, energy localization through surface plasmonics uh, uh, the, um, uh, and this extra displacement you get on, on the, the uh, surfaces uh, of nanoclusters or in these uh, caves that are on the micrometric nickel at lower temperatures, you can imagine that this energy -like localization uh, and plasmonics combine together so that the impinging IR has a much greater effect and Ed Storms might say, ah, it's nano caves, it's caves that's important. And, and, and really, I, I think he probably is right at, at, at the, the, the cooler level. But when you get up to the high temperatures, it's a kind of similar thing going on, but it's, it's, it's not in the caves so much now. It's on the nanostructures, which are because they're nanoparticles. Okay. What else can you do with nanoparticles? Um, well... There's not just the scale of the nanoparticles, there is the structure of the nanoparticles. So uh, this piece of research here, which you can go and look at, nanoparticle shape response to surface plasmons. Okay? So this article is very good, uh, it's quite in depth, um, but here you can see uh, the nanometer range of um, light and uh, the extinction efficiency of uh, the, the, the plasmic process going on there. And uh, you can see as you go through different shapes of nanoparticles, and this is uh, for gold, so these aren't necessarily what you would see with uh, different transition metals. Um, uh, but uh, for instance, here where we've got um, the uh, uh, icosahedron here, this uh, dark blue line, 
You can see it's kind of centered around um, uh, this icosahedron here, uh, which is like a 20-sided uh, uh, nanoparticle. Uh, you can see it's around 410 nanometers, 420, 400, something around there. And that is in the IR. So, you know, um, these kind of things, you know, they're all kind of lining up. So you have the right structure. You have it in the right size domain. Uh, you have the right type of stimulation. You can accentuate it by, by maybe having a field. And when you look at thinking about reactor structures, you could have a... I don't know, maybe self-sustain is, is, is supported by having a field and maybe that field is rotating and maybe the three phases in the Lagana reactor is about creating an electrostatic field that drives all of the H- and the electrons in a certain direction and all the protons and maybe the alpha particles in a different direction. And you can see how all these things are kind of maybe lining up. So get your thinking caps on and see how this affects the process. Okay, uh, some cutting edge research right now. I want to show you this. This is using uh, to create uh, nickel and um, uh, platinum, both of which are, you know, uh, uh, elements that Rossi is claiming are active, uh, and they should be. Piantelli would say they're both uh, transition metals. Um, you, they're creating these uh, nano frames. So, you, you, you actually have a, a very few atoms on the surface, but a larger structure. And so you're using very, very little material to create particles that you might think were perfect for this process. And platinum is good because it, it operates at a much higher temperature than nickel. So there's a link to the, the, the news article where this is discussed. And um, I, I draw your attention to the shape. Uh, it is a rhombic dodecahedron. Yeah? A rhombic dodecahedron. So we're back to this concept of vari variations on the dodecahedron. I wouldn't get so set on that being the particular structure. It does depend on the transition metal. And like I say, there's probably people out there that know a lot more about crystal structures and, and how you move between one type of crystal structure and another and how resilient they are to temperatures and so forth. Anyway, I want to now then look at see if there's any historical evidence out there that supports um, and, and connects the kind of Piantelli nickel hydrogen with uh, plasmonics. And surprisingly, there is. And it's precise combination of these concepts. And the man that did it is Vittorio Villante. This is Vittorio Villante uh, at ENEA, and he's meeting Bill Gates here. And uh, you can go and see about this visit. Just do a search. Bill Gates meets Vittorio Violanti at ENEA. You'll find it. So this is Vittorio Violanti. Um, and this chap here apparently is working with industrial heat. Uh, uh, you can check your sources on that. Uh, and uh, something to do with the organization of ICCF19 as well. So you can see a lot of connections going on here. But what is the research I'm referring to that's so important? Uh, to summing this whole presentation up. That is this. Analysis of nickel hydride thin film after surface plasmon generation by laser technique. Okay, so the conclusion of this was the measurements revealed a very clear effect on 63 copper and 60, uh, 65 copper isotopic ratio shift. Very difficult to explain in terms of isotopic enrichment. In the blank, which was basically plain nickel 62 and 64, uh, the isotopic ratio between 63 CU and 65 CU shows the larger abundance of the first one as expected. The situation is completely changed in the, bla uh, the black. This is the one that's been hydrided. So it's nickel hydride where the most abundant copper isotope resulted, uh, results to be 65 copper with a shift that is 1,360%. Now bearing in mind this was only exposed uh, uh, to three hours of laser radiation to create the plasmon polaritons. Okay? Um, and look at this! Such a result reproduces the data obtained with some hours of electrolysis when a weak 
emission of x-rays was detected, but the effect seems to be enhanced. Right? So you have impinging, I don't know, IR on nanostructures. And the, this creates plasma on platons. And in, when you have the, the hydrided nickel, you get something's going on that's making the 62 and the 64 become 63 and 65. And I'll go into it in a later uh, uh, presentation, but I want you to think about isomers and I want you to research around isomers. But not only that, and, and uh, isomers in relation to weak x-rays, yeah? And then I want you to look at uh, um, the, the reaction chain that takes 63 uh, nickel and 65 nickel towards uh, um, uh, uh, nickel, um, uh, uh, copper 63 uh, and copper 65. Also take note of the half-life of the process between nickel 65 and copper 65 decay chain in comparison to the half-life between nickel 63 and copper 63. So, results seem to be a clear signature of Lenner process occurring in condensed matter under the electrodynamic trigger of plasmon polaritons. The local EM field created by plasma and polaritons should also be responsible uh, of the energy, it's an Italian translation, uh, transfer mechanism from the composite nucleus to the lattice uh, because of the field effect on the nuclear decay process. Okay? So, that was opening the door part one. Thank you for watching. Uh, I, if you haven't had a chance to look at the other videos, please go, please go and look at our channel. Please subscribe to our channel. Uh, uh, there'll be much more videos explaining this process to the best of our ability. And I would encourage you, if you haven't already, to start taking part in the open research. Look at what we're doing. Analyze the, the things that we've said today. Come forward with suggestions on how this could be bettered. And please, if you haven't had a chance to donate, it would really help us run the best quality replications that we can. Thank you. See you in the next video.